You're one microscopic cog in his catastrophic plan Designed and directed by his red right hand Scream 5, which I'm going to be calling it for the purposes of this video, I'm not calling it Scream or Scream 2022, it'll get too confusing, it's too much of a mouthful, this movie is a sequel, it's Scream 5. It's directed by Matt bettinelli Olpin and Tyler Gillette of the team Radio Silence, who brought us films like Ready or Not, one of my favorite horror comedies of the last few years, and it's the first film in the Scream franchise that is not written or directed by Kevin Williamson or Wes Craven. So. Big shoes to fill. The Scream franchise is one that's been going on for 25 years at this point and has managed to be consistent and yet constantly evolve and always do something new and never get boring. It's been doing the same thing essentially for five films now and it manages to stay fresh and that is because of how meta this entire franchise is, how self-aware it is, how it evolves along with the genre that it's commenting on. The original Scream was groundbreaking. It changed the game entirely. It introduced the entire idea of meta-commentary to the horror genre, where it was poking fun at other slasher films and itself, and then doing the things that it was talking about and criticizing. It's very clever, and it's very meta, and it's very... It was, it was one of a kind at the time, and it was such a groundbreaking film that it... There, you still see traces of it in the zeitgeist to this day. There are- how, Ghostface is such an iconic character to this day because that original film was so unique and came at a time when horror was getting a little stale and really just doing the same thing over and over and over and over and nothing was really hitting with obvious exceptions like Candyman. The 90s were a weird time. Scream 2 ended up just doing the same thing but commenting on more of the tropes that hadn't been addressed in the first film. So it managed to do something new. Scream 3 is weird. <laughs> it goes a little too hard on the meta commentary to the point where it, it gets a little out of control and ridiculous and honestly is much more of a comedy than the first two are. Scream 4, which came out in 2011, goes back to basics and, and serves as sort of a, you know, the, the 10 years later type sequel updated for, you know, the times at the time, which was social media and everyone live streaming everything, everyone posting everything on YouTube. So it was an interesting update to the franchise, and there were things about it that didn't work, there were things about it that did. It committed some cardinal sins, like removing Red Right Hand from the movie entirely. I don't want to talk about that. But anyway, that brings us to this film, Scream 5, like I said. Bettinelli Olpin and Gillette had huge shoes to fill. This is the first movie not directed by Wes Craven. This is the first film not written by Kevin Williamson. Is it going to be more of the same? Is it going to feel different? Is it going to feel too different? Huge shoes to fill. And what is incredible about Scream 5 is that it manages not only to fill those shoes, but it manages to comment on the very idea of it having bigger shoes to fill. I can't go too much into spoilers. I don't want to. But I will delve into some more some some spoilers on the the commentary that the film is trying to make, which I found very interesting and very cool, and a really welcome update to this franchise to modern times. Scream Five ends up feeling like the proper send off to the original cast that Scream Four wanted to be. It touches on a lot of the same themes, but in a way that's much more realized with how much the world has changed since 2011 and how much the horror genre has evolved since 2011. There's a lot more to explore in that meta-commentary, which is as biting as ever. The horror community is constantly polarized and infighting over what counts as horror and everyone's gatekeeping of whether or not this is, counts as a horror movie. Oh, it's not a horror movie. It's a thriller. Shut the fuck up. If I hear the word elevated horror, I want to, I, 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 I'm going to kill. But what's interesting about that is it, it addresses the idea where there's this argument of whether or not there's value to be found in slasher movies doing the same thing over and over again versus something more esoteric like, you know, It Follows or Mandy or whatever. This movie just couldn't have come at a better time given all of the constant infighting give and the existence of the internet. The point is, this movie couldn't have come out at a better time. The one thing the Scream franchise has constantly excelled at is having its finger on the pulse of the ins and outs of horror and the community and it is a film series that has evolved constantly ultimately by staying the same there's a formula to it 
a very simple formula. And Scream 5 is a lovely return to form for this series. While ultimately it is another Scream sequel, I'd argue that it's the best one since the first movie. Radio Silence was a great pick for this film, and they excel at balancing tension and levity. Ready or Not was one of my favorite horror comedies of the last few years, and a real high point in horror for me overall. It's clear that they have a deep love for the self-aware meta-horror that Scream created, and this movie ends up being a great sequel, as well as a love letter to the franchise as a whole, all of its ups and downs, and the horror genre as a whole. It functions as both a sequel and a seeming franchise revival as the film coins it a requel, which, you know, things like Halloween 2018, Candyman, The Force Awakens. It's a movie that is a sequel, but does the same thing updated for modern age. Poking fun at Hollywood's need to have their cake and eat it too by essentially remaking the first movie as a sequel to the first movie, <coughs> Halloween. It's worth noting though that what impressed me most about this movie was the way that it turned the expected on its head, and the fact that it is such a back-to-basics film going right back to some of the original locations in Woodsboro. This film manages to be really impressive by making the expected into the unexpected. It has a way of keeping you on your toes by really playing up the whodunit aspect, which really worked about the first Scream movie and kind of disappeared from the other three. And because the movie is foreshadowing certain events in such a way that feel way too obvious, you're then surprised when things play out exactly in that way because you're like, oh shit, they actually did it. The Scream franchise has never been bad overall, even at its weakest, which Scream 3 was, like I said, weird, but Scream 5 works best because it's such a return to form. Also, side note, like I said, this movie is such a back to basics. They brought back Red Right Hand. I was so happy. It's the best usage of the song in any of the movies, hyping it up because it's a great scene. In typical requel fashion, the original legacy cast is here, but they are taking a back seat to introduce a new cast of characters and like Scream 4, but you know, in Scream 4, most of them died and we don't see Kirby anymore in this movie, even though there is an Easter egg it is a super minor easter egg. I guess this is a spoiler, but it, you literally could admit, can miss it entirely. There's a, a YouTube video that's a related video that's an interview with Survivor Kirby Reed, which I think is cool. I love that it's confirmed she's alive. She's not in this movie. <laughs> but, that being said, the entire main cast of characters, both new and Legacy, they're all pretty fantastic here, but there are really a few standouts I want to mention. First of all, Nev Campbell has not lost a step as Sidney Prescott once. I mean, she really, the second she comes back on screen, the movie just like opens up. You just feel like this warmth come back because you f you're like, oh, things are okay. Sydney's here. We got this. It's good. And that ho all three of the original legacy characters are used fairly sparingly here. I mean, they probably have about 30 minutes of screen time overall, but every second counts and every second they're all on screen, every second of screen time they share is wonderful. On that note, David Arquette is one of the best damn parts of this movie and really, like, Dewey finally gets some awesome character development here. I adored it. I thought that they made his character really human and really sad, and, like, you can tell that all of this has really taken a toll on him, and he's just kind of grown a bit jaded to it all. And it's nice to see him being something other than the goofy comic relief. There is a deep sadness to Dewey. <laughs> And Arquette, like I said, he just makes him feel haunted, but ultimately still heroic, and I love that. And then when it comes to the new cast, they're all great, but there are a few that I really wanted to address because, wow. First of all, Jenna Ortega as Tara, who, you know, is we see in the trailer, she is the opening scene of the movie. She is excellent. I take back everything I said about her during my review of Babysitter Killer Queen, but Tara in this movie, it was wonderful to see how well Jenna Ortega could do with, you know, good writing by her side. Tara's a fantastic character. I really wanted to see more of her in this movie. Um, that's not a spoiler. I'm not saying she dies. I'm just saying her screen time in this movie is less than what I would have wanted from it. Forget it. <laughs> but she was one of the real standouts for me. I thought she was incredible, and I really hope she starts getting more roles with better writing because, wow. Jack Quaid, again, I love this dude in everything he's in. I adore the boys. I, lo I thought he was wonderfully tragic in Tragedy Girls, which is a great movie, and if you haven't watched it, I would highly recommend it, especially if you like Scream. Great movie. 
But yeah, like I said, I love this dude and everything he's in. He's always super lovable, and he always has this fun energy where he, he can kind of be a little bit of a dick, but it's always playful, and he's always fun, and he's he, he's just, he always plays such a good guy, and it's, it's, it's fun to see him in a role like this. Especially in a movie that is so self-aware and funny and requires characters who are, you know, who can play off that, that type of energy. Jasmine Savoy Brown as Mindy. First of all, Mindy is Randy's niece, one of, twi one of two twins, and honestly, she is one of my favorite additions to the cast. Um, traditional scream fashion she goes off on the, the going the the rules of horror and the the all the meta commentary of the film echoing her her uncle in in certain ways that i love that were really wonderful parallels to the original film and honestly this girl is just killing it in the horror scene lately from this to sound of violence to yellow jackets which also i would highly recommend that if you have showtime definitely check that out i just want to see more of this girl she's really really good She's always very likable and always really cool. I, I don't know. I just, I want to see more of her in more horror stuff because she's great. But yeah, Scream would be nothing without Ghostface. Ghostface in this movie is terrifying, honestly. Like, this is the most menacing version of the character we've seen to date. The past four films have always played up that fact that he's very human. He's not a monster. He's not a, he's not unstoppable. He gets his ass kicked a lot. Um, this Ghostface doesn't really get his ass beat that much like he definitely you know gets knocked around a bit but there is a much more menacing energy to it and there is much more intelligence behind the character and there are certain points in this movie that are really intense because Ghostface is really clever and coming up with ideas where he is steps ahead of everybody and it's really cool not to mention the ways he's killing people are they're, they're not overly gory, but they are brutal, and they are violent, and there is some gore in this movie that is gnarly. And Ghostface's return to screen here is a memorable one, and that includes Roger Jackson returning as the voice of Ghostface, and God, I love this man and the energy he brings to it every time. I love the fact that he really plays up how much this Ghostface is relishing this and really enjoying it, and honestly, yeah, I was here for it probably my favorite rendition of Ghostface to date as far as the way the character acts. Not as far as who's under the mask, but I do love that too, but I'm not going to talk about that because that's a spoiler. Anyway, <laughs> I have a few minor criticisms, but nothing crazy. I mean, without Wes Craven, it was there was always going to be something different. And like I said, Radio Silence does a great job at creating a movie that very much feels like the re the other films but Wes Craven always brought this sort of tonal warmth to his movies that I felt lack this movie was definitely lacking and I, I I did miss that I'll admit it but all in all I do think he Wes Craven I think would be really proud to, to of this movie I think he'd really I think he would approve it and my only other complaint honestly I did not love Melissa Barrera as Sam the lead of this movie and I, I don't know if the problem was the writing for her character or if it was her. I don't think it was the writing because I, I, I liked the character of Sam, but I felt like Marissa, Melissa Barrera was weaker than the rest of the cast around her, and it was just kind of noticeable whenever they were all on screen together. I, I don't know. I didn't love her performance but it wasn't like didn't break the movie by any means i still loved the hell out of this movie and i want to see it again especially knowing what happens now so i can appreciate the rest of it more um i would recommend it it's very very cool definitely would check it out it's in theaters now i'm sure it'll be on demand very soon the world sucks out there but it seems like covid might be maybe possibly sort of questionably getting a little hopefully better or at least omicron i don't know this sucks man i'm just whatever like i said things are changing quick life update i'm moving soon uh last this is probably one of the last times you're going to see me in this location there might be one more video because i'm doing a sundance thing it'll be fun um but yeah i i there's a lot of changes happening like i said not just to the channel but in my life i'm moving i'm going to be changing this channel format quite a bit i'm just getting things arranged for that um I have a short film that is, you know, nearing completion that I'm trying to get done before I move. It's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. I'm overwhelmed at the point, and I haven't been making videos, and I apologize for that. Um, 
and I will be making new content for y'all once I get things sorted out and things settle down a little and I won't be gone entirely but I will just be continuing to you know occasionally post when I want to talk about something so that's that uh, if you like this channel you want to see more click down there like comment subscribe there's a patreon link down in the description if you want to donate to this channel help me make new quality content help me turn this into my job that would be cool I would appreciate that I would actually love to do this as a career and you know make movies also but you know this would be what pays the bills that would be cool I would love that anyway um I look forward to seeing you all very soon I will have some new content to talk about I'm very excited um thank you all for watching Bye. Hello, Sydney. It's an honor.